With the benefit of hindsight and the opportunity to adjust the facts to fit the story, the best decisions can be made to look like strokes of genius. Their creators were not lucky, they were good. Such situations abound in the history of aviation, but few were as seismic as that experienced by North American aviation in 1942. The ins and outs of how their first iconic product, the P-51 Mustang, came to be is a great story. The short version is that North American Aviation was a fledgling company in 1940. They had enjoyed a couple of small successes with the O-47 observation plane and BT-9 trainer, but those aircraft had only sold a few hundred units each. As the war in Europe loomed and then broke out, Britain sent a team over to the US to source and purchase war materiel. High-end fighters were top on the list. The US only produced one aircraft, that came close to meeting the RAF's needs, the Curtis P-40. Unfortunately, Curtis' factory was running close to full capacity. The British therefore tried to find a licensed builder of P-40s to supply them. After some toing and froing, the young and aggressive North American company convinced the RAF to take their own experimental design instead of a licensed-built P-40. They got a prototype flying in a crazy 102 days, and the RAF agreed to take a batch. Sadly, the P-51A had an Allison engine with a one-stage supercharger. It wasn't much use in the high-altitude air war in Europe. So although the RAF saw the promise of the P-51's fundamental design, they needed more go. Then some bright spark had the idea of mating the brilliant airframe of the Mustang with the best aero engine in the world at the time, the Rolls-Royce Merlin, and the rest is history. More than 15,000 Mustangs would be built. The type would serve well into the 1950s and even in small numbers the 1960s. North American aviation was set. But even while the production lines were being built and the first pilots trained, the Mustang had already been rendered obsolete by developments in Germany. The ME262 flew in July 1942 and was ready for operations by 1943. Fortunately, it was not produced in sufficient numbers to alter the course of the war. With jet engines and a revolutionary, if not fully realised, swept wing, the ME-262 was fully 150 miles an hour faster than the best Allied fighters and climbed 25% faster. If a pilot knew how to use these advantages, then he could strike the slower piston-engined aircraft with relative impunity. Having been one of the big winners from the war thus far, North Americans' leadership were damned if they were going to let that advantage slip away. In November 1944, they commissioned a design study for a jet fighter. Their idea was to mate the proven wing from the Mustang with a new fuselage suitable for a centrifugal flow jet engine. This necessitated a large intake at the front and a tailpipe at the rear. North American's initial proposal was that their new fighter be powered by a licensed produced de Havilland Goblin centrifugal flow engine but this was changed to the Axial Flow J35 in search of greater responsiveness and leaner packaging. The study sufficiently impressed the US Navy that they ordered three prototypes designated XFJ-1. This ultimately saw production as the Fury, the short but interesting history of which is another story. Never wanting to be outdone, the US Army Air Force spotted the interesting progress North American were making on jet aircraft design and, on the 18th of May 1945, they commissioned three of their own prototypes, designated XP-86. XP-86 was to be a clear air mass day fighter with speed in excess of 600 miles an hour. As was typical at the time, North American built a full-scale wooden mock-up of the design, which you can see here. This was for an aircraft to touch over 36 feet long, weighing 11,500 pounds. It would have a maximum speed of 582 miles an hour at 10,000 feet, 
and be able to climb at 5,850 feet per minute to an altitude of 46,000 feet. Combat radius was to be 297 miles on its 410 gallons of internal fuel. This would be extended to 750 miles when carrying two drop tanks. The Air Force approved this mock-up as the design configuration for XP-86 on the 20th of June 1945. I find this a slightly strange thing to have done, as the XP-86 didn't meet the specification and its performance would have been inferior to the Republic XP-84 Thunderjet, which would likely get into production at least a year ahead of it. North American must have known that their project had only a limited life in its present form, as they actively went searching for solutions to their performance problem. Just as a solution to the underwhelming performance of the original Mustang appeared from across the Atlantic, so it was with the XP-86. As the Allies rolled through Europe before and after the surrender, they encountered a treasure trove of German technology and test materials. Such was the scale of the bounty that US teams were instructed not to waste time attempting to assess this material on site, but were instead instructed to package it up and send it back to the US. Amongst the flood were many documents relating to the aerodynamics of different wing types. The North American team had already established that the only way to get the performance they needed was to introduce a wing sweep, but exactly how to do it was a wicked challenge. Not only that, they would have to commit to the redesign on their own ticket. The Air Force was unaware that North American were contemplating taking such a technical risk. Swept wings were advantageous at high speeds, particularly when approaching the speed of sound. For example, testing in North American's wind tunnel showed that a swept wing had a fifth of the drag of a straight wing at Mach 0.9. The problem was that stability at low speeds was very poor, creating a serious stalling issue when landing. This, incidentally, was also a problem with the ME262, which featured only a 15 degree sweep. Amongst the captured materials was a proposal for a version of the ME262 with a 35 degree wing sweep that the German designers called the Arrow Wing. North American's design team was very enthusiastic about its potential and elected to install it on the XP86. In some ways, though, the decision was easy to make. The Navy was going ahead with the XFJ1 Fury, so there would be business and learnings there and the prospects of getting the XF-86 into production were vanishingly small without a big change. So on the 18th of August 1945, North American's management gave approval for more funding and a delay to the project timeline to go with the swept wing. This was a good call. The arrow wing solved the speed issue. Wind tunnel tests showed that the XP-86 would now comfortably break through 600 miles an hour but the stability issues remained. Fortunately, the aptly named Harrison Storms convinced his colleagues in the engineering team that the answer was to install a leading-edge slat that would automatically change the profile of the wing below a certain speed. Aerodynamic forces would open the slats below 290 knots, smoothing out the airflow over the top of the wing and thereby reducing the stall speed. At higher speeds, the slats were pushed flush with the wing, minimising drag and allowing maximum performance. Although elegant in conception, this proved easier on paper than in practice. Once again, the answer lay in captured German technology. The ME262 had a mechanical slat system that was cranked out during takeoff and landing. Although the North American design team had loftier goals, their frustration led to their having an entire ME262 wing being shipped from Wright Field to Los Angeles. It was a treasure trove of ideas. The engineering team took the wing apart and remanufactured its slats to fit the XP86 wing. This combination worked pretty well, well enough that the first seven XP86s used ME262 slat tracks and locks in their wings. <laughs> 
In its final form, the XP86 featured a slightly altered 35.2 degree swept wing. The tail and rudder were now also swept by 35 degrees. The tail surfaces were also fully trimmable so that they could be adjusted to improve both low and high speed flight. Because of this change, the XP86's overall length increased by 2 feet to 37.5 feet. Wing sweep was not the only innovation in the XP86's wing. It was constructed in an innovative new manner featuring a double skin between which fuel tanks and other equipment could be sighted. To save weight, the skins tapered so that they were thicker at the fuselage join and very much thinner at the wingtips. Manufacturing this entailed the creation of entirely new machine tools with very high precision, the cutting edge of 1940s industrial processes, and something probably only possible in the US. Similarly, the fuselage was also interesting in that it was built in two sections. It breaks around the location of the engine to increase ease of maintenance. The final arrangement for the prototype was agreed in March 1946. It must have been some relief to North American's management. To give you an idea how beneficial the radical redesign was, we can compare the XP86 to the related but much more conventional XFJ1 Fury. Because the weight of the XP86 had bloomed, but power at this point had not grown with it, the Fury climbed faster and could climb higher, at least initially. But even with the disappointing J35 engine, the XP86 is nearly 60 miles an hour faster. It would go faster still. The XP86's first flight came on the 1st of October 1947. To get to this point, over 800,000 engineering hours had been expended, of which 340,000 had been spent drafting. The three-year-long design process was glacial by the standards of the day, but it had been worth waiting for. At the controls was George Welch, the first pilot to take off and engage enemy aircraft during the attack on Pearl Harbor. Although an insufficiently powerful hydraulic cylinder in the front landing gear did cause a slightly heart-stopping moment, the flight was highly successful. It looked like North America were on to a winner. Officially, the XP-86 went supersonic for the first time on the 26th of April 1948. Unofficially, this bar had been broken in early October 1947 some days before Chuck Yeager officially became the first pilot to break the same barrier in the Bell X-1. George Welch probably deserves the plaudits that Yeager gets for that achievement. The US Army Air Force had been following the progress of the redesign with interest. When it seemed likely that Ed Hawkey and his team were going to succeed, the Army Air Force placed an initial order for 33 P-86As on November the 20th, 1946. Having budgeted $439,000 a unit, they were pleasantly surprised to get these aircraft for only $178,408 a piece. The major difference between these aircraft and the XP-86 was the engine. The underpowered J-35 was ditched for the new General Electric J-47. This offered 4,850 pounds of thrust, and took the P-86A to 679 miles an hour. Climb rate nearly doubled, and the service ceiling jumped to 46,000 feet. These aircraft were delivered from May 1948. Of course, a fighter needs weapons. Predictably for the time, the F-86A carried six 50 caliber M3 Browning machine guns. Each was fed from a cassette magazine that could hold 300 rounds, but usually was loaded with only 267. The guns were installed with three each side of the lower fuselage, an arrangement that gave excellent accuracy and reduced the impact of muzzle flash when firing in the dark. They were bore sighted to converge at 1200 feet and were slightly angled to improve ammunition feed. For aerodynamic reasons, early model Sabres had retractable covers over the gun ports. These were designed to open in 1 20th of a second when the trigger was pulled. Unfortunately, at high altitudes they tended to freeze shut and they were omitted in later batches. Plastic plugs that were forced out when the guns were fired replaced the covers, but most pilots chose to fly without them 
Spent shells were retained within the aircraft as without their weight the centre of gravity would move significantly aft. On the ground these could be removed from a door in the front landing gear well. The guns were typically loaded with a mix of incendiary and armour-piercing bullets. The M3 had a rate of fire of 1100 rounds a minute, so a three-second burst from six guns would put 15 pounds of bullets on the target. In period, this was regarded as a little on the light side, particularly when the MiG-15 was encountered. I'll spare you a detailed rundown of that aircraft here, but in combination, its 37mm and 223mm cannons put down 40 pounds of shell weight in a three-second burst, some of which was explosive. The initial A-model Sabres were equipped with the same Mark 18 gun sight as the P-51D. This was a lead computing sight that incorporated a gyro and a fixed sight system. It was relatively simple to use. When the enemy was sighted, the pilot set the span selector to the wingspan of the enemy aircraft. He then aimed his F-86 so that the enemy appeared within a circle of six diamond images on the reflector glass. At the same time, he rotated the range control unit until the diameter of the circle was the same size as the target. If he got this right and successfully framed the target for a second, then the site automatically computed the required lead. Space was reserved for a gun sight radar, but this was not fitted until later. The gun camera was at the bottom of the intake. The first major production batch that followed the initial 33 was to be called the F-86B. This was intended to be a rough field variant with reinforced wings and bulkier landing gear. Initial testing and advances in high-pressure tyres made these modifications unnecessary. The Army Air Force therefore altered their second contract with North American to provide it with 188 A5 versions. These included numerous small improvements. The canopy was improved to include bulletproofing and an explosive release system so that ejection became a one-pull escape. Previously, the canopy had to be manually slid back before the seat could be fired. Guns and the gun compartments received heaters for high altitude use. The canopy seals were modified to improve pressurization effectiveness and the slats were completely redesigned for reliability. As these aircraft were just arriving, another order for a further 333 aircraft was placed. These follow-on batches featured a big upgrade, the Sperry A1B gun sight. The unit incorporated an ANAPG 5C ranging radar to automatically acquire targets and calculate lead. Although relatively crude, it filled the empty space above the engine intake, and when it worked, it promised improved accuracy. The A5 batch also had simplified cockpit wiring to reduce maintenance overhead, and they were able to carry two underwing 120 gallon drop tanks. Previously, the Sabre could only carry 200 gallon ferry tanks but these were not suitable for combat use as they didn't separate well from the wings. The 120 gallon and subsequent combat tanks can be identified by the wings at the back and the tapered profile, both designed to improve separation at high speed. There's also an additional brace on the outside of the pylon to improve stability. Drop tanks were a real must for the Sabre, especially when it was being flown aggressively at high altitudes like it was in Korea. At one point, Sabre wings were going through 100 drop tanks a day and the supply began to run out. P-80 drop tanks had to be modified for use on the Sabre. These large Mizawa tanks had new fins and the lug points were changed to match the Sabre's drop tank plumbing. A good bit of infield ingenuity. Issues with the J-47 delayed service entry, but finally on the 15th of February 1949, the 94th Fighter Interceptor Squadron at March Air Force Base, California, took delivery of the first F-86As. Amongst their first jobs was to name the new fighter, which had hitherto been unofficially known as the Silver Charger. A contest was held. 78 names were submitted, and, as we all know, the result was to call the new fighter the Sabre. The contemporary media consistently referred to it as the Sabre Jet for reasons lost to history. By January 1950, there were five fighter groups equipped with the Sabre, and upgrades continued to flow. The last few of the A5 batch had the vastly improved Sperry A1CM gunsight based around the ANAPG 30 radar. 
This unit had a sweep range of between 150 and 3,000 yards. It automatically locked on and tracked targets, projecting the lead pipper on the armoured glass windshield. Although a brilliant system when it worked, it was definitely not flawless. Below 6,000 feet of altitude, it tended to get confused by returns off the ground. The radar, a complex mix of temperamental valves assembled by hand, could be finicky and unreliable. When it failed, there was no fixed sight as a backup. Just to make things confusing, some Sabres had the new A1CM gun sight with the older ANAPG-5 radar. These are F-86A6s. The full beans A1CM and ANAPG-30 aircraft are A7s. I imagine that somewhere there's someone with a PhD in Sabre variants. It isn't the easiest thing to get your head around. The A7 system was much easier to use than before. When turned on with a MIG in the centre of the site, a circle would start out small and expand out until it covered the wings of the aeroplane. When that happened, the pilot would know the site was computing and the pipper was on the target. Whenever you shot, you'd hit it. Most of the A5s were ultimately upgraded to the A7 standard and had versions of the J47 giving either £5,340 or £5,450 of thrust. In total, 521 A5s entered service. Although combat capable, the A1s were mainly used for testing and training. If you're wondering, the easiest way to identify an F86A is to look at the nose cone which was fiberglass in the A and the early E. In some photos it's obvious because they were often left unpainted and are therefore brown against the silver jet. If it's painted, the seam line often stands out because the paint doesn't look the same shade on the metal as it does on the fiberglass. The Sabre is renowned as a pilot's aeroplane. It is perhaps this fact alongside the legacy of its exploits in Korea and other theatres that are behind the enduring fascination we have with it. Tens, perhaps even hundreds of thousands of fighter pilots flew one. For many it must have been their first taste of a truly high-performance jet fighter. George Bailey, a veteran RAF pilot who converted from the Meteor to the Sabre, recounted how big the Sabre felt the first time he approached it. Probably because of the tail fin, but whatever it was, you felt like you had plenty of airplane. Climbing in was easy enough, and the cockpit was roomy and comfortable in the traditional American manner, certainly by comparison with those of some other fighters. I remember the dynamo-like whine of the electric motor driving the hydraulic system pump, and the extraordinary feeling of the cockpit having a life of its own, with its glowing warning lights and flickering pressure gauges. From the cockpit, the view was excellent, and you became conscious of the drooping leading edge slats and the odd excitement of a wing sweeping back behind you. Getting into the Sabre was easy. To do so, you grabbed the folding handle incorporated into the gun bay door, stepped onto the ammunition bay door, and then put your left foot into the retractable door just under the black stripe. As with many of the details of the Sabre, the engineering is just lovely. Starting requires an external starter cart, once lit and rolling, the aircraft is steered by the nose wheel. The bubble canopy gives great all-round visibility, making taxiing easy. When airborne, the Sabre was vice-free, whereas Soviet and even British and French fighters could be treacherous in certain flight conditions, the Sabre was beautifully balanced. Its controls were light, the aircraft was strong, it could be flown to maximum performance time after time with no worries. Such was its predictability that it was one of the few aircraft of the period that was cleared for intentional spinning. Later modifications to the aircraft would reduce its docility at low speeds to gain better performance and manoeuvrability, but the aircraft remained very pleasant and fun to fly. And speaking of modifications and variations, we should talk about how the Sabre evolved. The second production version of the Sabre Day Fighter was famous, but actually quite few in number. Outwardly, the F-86 looks basically like the A-7. It does, however, incorporate a big change that bestowed much greater combat capability, the all-flying tail. Pilots in the early Sabre squadrons had been quick to report that the aircraft felt strange to fly in the transonic regime around Mach 1. 
the controls seemed to reverse so that if the pilot wanted to pull up, then the aircraft would continue to go down. Now, of course, the controls weren't actually reversing. They just weren't responding effectively because at those high speeds, the airflow over the elevators was so great that the hydraulically boosted circuits couldn't move them. Thus, the aircraft would just carry on going where it was going. The solution was to replace the F-86A's system of control cables boosted by hydraulics with an all-hydraulic system that did away with the cables. This was much stronger and could easily overcome the additional forces. Although they had regained control over the aircraft, it still felt sluggish. This was because the combination of stabilizer and elevators was right for the size of aircraft, but the elevators were too small to give enough control response in transonic flight. The North American team went back to the drawing board again, redesigning the entire operation of the tail so that the stabilizer and elevators moved together. In effect, this created a larger elevator surface without changing the physical dimensions of the controls. The famous all-flying tail was a major breakthrough. Its only drawback was that it removed direct connection between the control stick and the surfaces. Pilots didn't like this. Once again, the engineers came up with an ingenious solution, though. They used a system of bungee cords and counterweights to create a primitive force feedback system, giving artificial feel to the pilot. Externally, all of this change is identifiable only by a slight bulging of the aft fuselage to house the gearing mechanism for the stabilizer. Greater maneuverability put the Sabre on a more even, some would even say a superior footing against the MiG-15. 111 E1 and the very similar E5 Sabres were built. Production was then supposed to move to the F model, but yet more delays at GE meant the engines just weren't ready. 132 E10s were built with provision to accept the new engine. A further 100 E15s were constructed with rerouted hydraulics to eliminate an issue in which a hit at one point would disable the entire system. These were all eventually retrofitted with the new engine and new wings. The E was supposed to be a short-lived interim step, but ended up being produced and shipped to combat squadrons in Korea from April to December 1952. After all that, we have finally got to the main production saber, the really famous one. By this point, Korea was a real worry to the US. The Soviet Union was very clearly an ideological enemy and a global strategic threat. The US and its NATO allies had perhaps been a little too delighted that the brutality of the Second World War was past and had relaxed their guard. Rearming was needed both to check communist expansion in Asia and to dissuade any rash action by the Soviets in Europe. Hence, sabre production was really ramped up. To this end, as early as 1950, North American had taken on a lease at the old Curtis plant in Columbus, Ohio. The factory that had churned out thousands of hell divers was turned over to making F model sabers. GE was able to produce enough Block 27 J47 engines for North American to start assembling F86 F1s in March 1952, so it overlapped with the E for more than six months. The new J-47 gave 6,090 pounds of thrust and produced even better performance than the A-5 and E. Top speed climbed to 688 miles at sea level, 600 miles an hour at 35,000 feet. Ceiling was pushed up to 52,000 feet, bringing the Sabre much closer to the MiG-15. More significant was the boost to climb rate, which went up from 7,800 feet per minute to 9,850 feet. This took away another MiG advantage. Sabre pilots could now close on the Soviet fighter in a climb. Remarkably, the more powerful engine also had better fuel consumption. The final point to note on the F was that the sophisticated but fragile A1CM site was replaced by a simpler, more rugged and just as effective unit called the A4. Needless to say that the Air Force couldn't get enough of the F-86F. Many were sent straight to Korea to replace losses and upgrade squadrons to the latest jet fighters. Amazingly, some of those squadrons were still flying P-51 Mustangs. <laughs>
The success of the all-flying tail made North American engineers wonder whether they could trade off some of the newfound stability for more speed and maneuverability at higher speeds. So they tried removing the slats that had made the Sabre possible in the first place. This change had the effect of reducing drag by sharpening the wing's leading edge. The downside was an increase in stall speed from 128 to 144 miles an hour, which would increase landing speeds. Making the wing a little bit bigger helped with low speed control, but did nothing much for the hot landing. But faster and turnier is always better in combat, so North American introduced the 6-3 wing on the production line and as a retrofit kit. 6-3 because it was extended 6 inches at the root and 3 inches at the tip. Eliminating the slats made more room for fuel, capacity for which increased from 435 to 505 gallons. It increased top speed to 695 miles an hour and enabled tighter, harder turns. Around 150 kits were rushed to Korea and installed on the earlier F-model Sabres flown by the most aggressive pilots. You can identify a hard wing saber with the 6.3 by the characteristic removable fillet that extends past the ammunition bay door at the wing root. On the ground, this had to be removed to get at the ammunition cans, so you can often see the wing structure in those photos. As in this one, the standard procedure was to put the fillet on top of the wing, so that's also a giveaway. Some aircraft also have a retaining wire that stops it being lost during maintenance. With the 6-3 wing, the Sabre was essentially a better fighter than even the MiG-15 bis under almost all conditions. Only its armament remained a wrinkle. A common complaint amongst the US aviators in Korea was that the Sabre lacked firepower. The MiG was both a slippery target to hit, was relatively simple and therefore durable, and had an amount of armour plate in critical locations. A colonel named Eagleston wrote a report for his superiors that calculated it took 1,024 rounds to down the average MiG-15. The Sabre typically only carried 1,600 rounds or so. The USAF's first idea was to use explosive 50 caliber bullets, but this did not prove successful. The obvious answer was to follow the course of many pistoned engine fighters and replace machine guns with 20mm cannons. Several 20mm weapons were available. The Air Force's current standard cannon was the M24. There was also a new rapid-firing 20mm called the T160 based on a Mauser design on the test bench and showing promise. Similarly, a new Ehrlichen-type gun was available. Both had revolving drum feeds and achieved stupendous rates of fire, 1500 rounds per minute in the T160's case. Conveniently, the T-160 was also being developed in a joint venture between the Springfield Arsenal and North American Aviation. It therefore formed the centerpiece of Project Dunval. Modifying the Sabre to take the cannons was not straightforward. The cannons and their ammunition were significantly bigger than those for the M3 Browning. They also generated more heat and gun gas when fired. Four cannons were fitted, with greater vertical spacing and a reinforced blast panel. To vent the explosive gun gas, North American designed small doors in the interior of the air intake to extract it. This would later prove to be a clever solution on paper, but hazardous in practice. A hundred rounds per gun were carried in a similar fashion as with the previous 50 caliber. A small observation on this picture. You can see that an additional gun port appears to have been painted on to disguise the fact that this is an aircraft that only has four guns. It must be for operational security or an attempt to gain a tiny tactical advantage. I found it interesting either way. Initial static testing on the ground revealed that the gun's recoil and ferocious vibrations would crack the structural supports in the nose. Rivets and bolts in the gun mounts were cracked. Back to the drawing board. Stronger nose supports and gun mounts fitted. The system now appeared satisfactory. In December 1952, eight aircraft were shipped to Japan on the aircraft carrier USS Wyndham. One remained there and the other seven went to Korea. Combat missions began in the first week of January 1953. Problems almost immediately began to surface. <laughs> 
The US testing had taken place at medium altitudes between 10,000 and 25,000 feet. The combat in Korea happened at much higher altitudes, often around 45,000 feet. On one of the first missions, Major John Moorhead engaged a MiG-15 at 46,000 feet with a long burst. The engine immediately flamed out. Moorhead managed to restart it at 20,000 feet and returned to Kimpo. A week later, Captain Murray Winslow fired at a MiG at 45,000 feet. Again, the engine stalled, but Winslow couldn't get it restarted. He punched out and the Sabre crashed into the Yellow Sea. The amount of gun gas being produced by the cannons was greater than the engineers had predicted. Combined with the lower oxygen content of the air at 45,000 feet, ingesting the gun gas caused a compressor stall. In an attempt to fix the issue, the gas ejection doors in the intake were welded shut. Two and a half inch holes were drilled in the aft section of the gun doors to vent some gas. A selector switch was also fitted in the cockpit to allow pilots to choose whether to fire two guns or four. These modifications didn't really seem to work. Captain Lonnie Moore went up to test the modifications, he fired the guns, suffered a compressor stall and then a turbine failure. He ejected and, once again, the Sabre crashed into the Yellow Sea. Lots of 20mm shells in the Yellow Sea. This test had been photographed from a chase plane. The photos showed that a big cloud of gas formed ahead of the Sabre when it fired. One of the engineers back in California had a bright idea. He fabricated a horseshoe-shaped clip that fit into the recessed muzzle trough of each cannon. When the guns fired, the clip broke up the ejected gas and prevented pooling in front of the aircraft. These were fitted to the remaining aircraft in Korea and would ultimately find their way into the cannon-armed F-86H-5 Sabre Hogs. Gunval continued. In 282 missions, 41 engagements occurred with MiGs. 13 of these were judged to have been hit, and 6 of them destroyed. None of the Sabres were downed in return, although 2 received cannon damage. The test was concluded on May 1st, 1953, and the aircraft were assigned to the Colorado National Guard. I understand that they ended up being used in a display team of all things. Although it was an interesting test, from an air-to-air -air perspective, Gunval didn't really demonstrate much advantage in arming the Sabre with cannons. With only 100 rounds per gun, there was only enough ammunition for 4 seconds of firing with 4 guns, or 8 seconds of using pairs. Although the Sabre was a reliable gun platform, that left very little margin for error. Two further aircraft had been modified with the Ehrlichan 206 RK 20mm cannon. The modification was similar to that in the M39. Four guns were installed, two on each side. The Ehrlichan gun was significantly larger than the M39. It was longer, entailing the fitment of a fairing instead of the flash blast panel at the end of the muzzle. Each gun had a hundred rounds of linked ammunition. When fired, the casings were ejected via chutes in the lower fuselage, but the links were retained in an attempt to keep the aircraft centre of gravity as it was. The venting system was better thought through than on the initial gun valve aircraft. When the guns were fired, vents opened on the interior of the air intake to act as a ram air scoop. The fast-flowing air forced gun gas out through vertical slits cut in the gun bay doors and some holes drilled in the spent-linked extraction door. The ram air scoop stayed open for five seconds after firing to ensure the gun bay was properly vented. A very similar system was used in the later F-100 Super Sabre. The 206 RK was a revolver cannon with a cyclic rate of between 1600 and 1800 rounds a minute at a muzzle velocity of 1066 feet per second. Although on paper the Ehrlichan was a better weapon than the M39 in terms of pure firepower, it was less successful in practice. When the modified aircraft were delivered to the Air Force in April 1954, it was discovered that even with structural reinforcement, the cannon's brutal recoil dented the fuselage ahead of the upper muzzles. The weapons produced more gun gas than the M39, causing flameouts anyway. More damning, the vibration made shooting less accurate and caused an unacceptably high number of stoppages. <laughs>
All of these faults were probably soluble, but since the M39 worked so well, there seemed little point in proceeding. The modified aircraft remained at Eglin until January 1958, and were then scrapped. The M39 was demonstrably a superb weapon, and as I said, it would go on to arm the excellent F-100 Super Sabre. After Korea, the Sabre found itself caught up in the Eisenhower Doctrine that swept through the US military. Eisenhower believed in preventing conventional war through the threat of massive nuclear retaliation. Weary of seeing so many lives lost in conflict, he wanted to reduce the capacity of American forces to fight conventional wars as a deterrent to politicians seeking to use force as an easier option to diplomacy. To that end, the idea of a pure air-to-air -air fighter, even one with a secondary ground attack role like the Sabre, was contrary to doctrine. The Air Force had already started on down this path with the gun-armed Sabre. The final F-35 block off the North American production line were wired for special stores, the Mark 12 atomic bomb. These would be employed using a toss technique in which the aircraft zoomed, climbed, rolled over and released the bomb in an arc towards its target. The fighter then rolled over the top and dived for separation. This manoeuvre was assisted by the M1 low altitude bombing system which calculated the correct release point. For the nuclear mission, the Sabre carried the Mark 12 on the port wing inner pylon. All other pylons carried drop tanks. 264 of this model was produced, and they were all operated from NATO bases close to the Warsaw Pact for a few years in the middle 1950s. The large force of E and F model Sabres was rapidly reduced after Korea. Many of the aircraft were sold or transferred to NATO allies. By 1955, the vast majority of the F-Sabres had been transferred to the Air National Guard. Only two regular Air Force squadrons continued to operate the type, the 115th and 195th Fighter Interceptor Squadrons based in California. They flew Sabres until 1959, as did some of the training units at Williams and Nellis. These units primarily supported foreign users. Even as the drawdown happened, remaining F-model Sabres were being modified with the F-40 wing, based on the upgraded Sabre being used by the reconstituted Japanese Self-Defense Force. This wing reintroduced inner wing slats and was 12 inches longer at the tip. The modified wing dropped the stall speed back down to about 120 miles an hour. The F-40 was the ultimate evolution of the original Sabre concept. Although a popular aircraft with its pilots, the changing mission of the Air National Guard in the Eisenhower era meant that the Sabre was not in service for a long time. A glut of F-86H Sabre Dogs, F-86D Sabre Dogs, F-89 Scorpions and even early F-100A and F-100C Super Sabres coming available as the Century Series began to deploy in numbers made it hard to justify retaining the Sabre jet. By 1960, it was effectively phased out. Airframes either ended up in the Arizona desert or scrapped. But despite a barely decade-long service life in the US inventory, its performance in Korea assured its legend. The A through F model Sabres were the last purpose-built and deliberately tasked air superiority fighters that the US Air Force would deploy until the F-15 Eagle in the mid-1970s. Heavy, complex, multi-role fighter bombers took their place in the tactical inventory. Extraordinary high-speed, high-altitude, computer-controlled and missile-armed interceptors took over in air defence. As it happens, neither of these options was what the tactical air force needed when it once again found itself deploying to Asia in 1964.